she lives, she travels the country speaking to activists and change makers from all walks of life, from from ranchers in Montana to urban farmers in Chicago to residents of Appalachia bringing new life into their communities to the new activist mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Sarah Van Gelder provides a stunning portrait of everyday Americans transcending hardship and working towards goals such as community, fairness, and equality. Van Jones calls the revolution where you live, quote, an inspiring account of grassroots leaders in the United States who are confronting racism, the climate crisis, and poverty. Sarah Van Gelder is the co-founder and editor-at-large of Yes! Magazine and has written for publications such as the Huffington Post, The Guardian, and the Christian Science Monitor. She lives on the reservation of the Suquamish tribe in Washington State. And tonight she will be in conversation with Mark Steiner, the host of The Mark Steiner Show, and um, the founder of the nonprofit Center for Emerging Media. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please give a warm welcome to Sarah Van Gelder and Mark Steiner. Good evening. So, we're also recording this. It's going to be um, on our website and our program, and we're going to record Sarah again tomorrow night in Baltimore, and we're going to mix those two together and put them out for the world to hear as a podcast and more. So, uh, there you are. So, your voices will be everywhere if you're going to be asking questions, just to let you know that. So, um, the revolution where you are, and I think that, let me just start with a really broad question, to let you go off, A, how this trip began, why it began, your truck, <laughs> why you named the truck what you named it, okay. and who painted that truck? <laughs> well, I started, I, I didn't know I was gonna go on a road trip. I was mulling the fact that Yes was hitting 20 years old, and it was one of those milestones that, you know, you have to think about, so, what have we accomplished? Where's the world? And I was looking at the big questions that we've been looking at ever since we started, yes, which are inequality. We now have like 20 people in the United States who own as much wealth as half of the American public population. We're looking at climate change because climate change is now spinning out of control much faster than scientists feared. We're looking at racism, which I think a lot of people had hoped that a African-American president was somehow going to put our era of racial injustice behind us, and we know that that didn't happen. So we've been looking at those questions for 20 years, and it was one of those moments where I was sort of saying, you know, it doesn't feel like we're making the headway we should be making. Things feel really stuck. And I happened to be in the office of a friend of mine, Akaya Windwood, and I was telling her about my worries, and she, she's one of those people who doesn't ask small questions, she asks big questions. And so she said, so if the universe could deploy the one small person that is you, what would it have you do? And so I said, well, I think I'd, I'd go out and see for myself. And so at that moment, I realized I needed to go. I needed to spend time out on the road, going to places I hadn't been to before. And I needed to talk to, pe to ordinary people and not go in there with preconceived ideas of what the stories were, just ask them questions about their lives and find out what they were doing about those issues. So the truck was the way to get to places that I didn't normally get to before. So I went to my local credit union and, and got a loan and bought a pickup truck and a little camper and um, headed out on the road. But before I did, I, as, as, uh, as was mentioned, I live on the Suquamish tribes land and have done a bunch of work over the course of 15 years with the tribe and one of my good friends is a uh, is an artist so I asked her if she would be willing to paint the truck so she did a lovely little image on the front of the truck of a, of a mother earth and some canoes which symbolized the journey but she was at the time she was dating a guy who was also native and a muralist, so he likes to do big things. So they took the sides of the truck and they turned it into this giant snail shell. So it looks like the whole truck is like a big snail. And it, it was appropriate to me, I was, I was talking to him about a snail because the, for one thing the truck is kind of slow. It doesn't get up to really fast highway speeds, which you, it's kind of nice out in west when, when you're going long, long distances. But, but okay, I was going kind of slow. And I was carrying my, my possessions on the back of the truck, so snail made sense. And I was also practicing slow journalism because I wasn't <laughs> trying to just parachute in, get somebody's story, already having made up my mind what the storyline was, and then leave. I was going there t to spend time and really hear people out. So, and we're gonna talk about some of these people. Uh, I, I wanna read a piece here early um, and just kind of explore what it means. He wrote, restorative ranching, resistance to mining and fracking, 
and the protection of water and soil is best done by the people who live rooted in a place, rooted in relationships, and others from that place, walk, working together how to be of, with, a healthy, evolving ecosystem. I began to see the power of these people who know and care for their place and are willing to stand up for it. And everywhere you went, that's the people you met, whether they were the native folks or ranchers or ranchers and native folks, or Greensport, North Carolina, or people in Appalachia, or people in Detroit, that's what you discovered. That's right. In fact, one of the stories, we can, we can go back to the ranchers if you want, but one of the stories that really struck home for me was when I was in Newark, New Jersey, where they're putting, where the new mayor, Ross Baraka, is, has selected two neighborhoods that have been neglected for years for special attention. And the, one of the first things they did is murals all over the neighborhoods that show the beauty of the neighborhoods. And on one of those murals I saw painted, we the people love this place. And then right by it, in fact, we the people call this place our home. Mm -hmm. And so for me, from the West Coast, used to seeing Newark as maybe a place that was not lovable, this was a real eye-opener for me. Because the people who lived in these, live in these neighborhoods understand that this is their home, this is their, this is their community, this is where their family memories are, this is where their future is. And to love this place and then to take responsibility for it and to say, we're going to make sure that this works for all of us and for the children. That's that kind of ethos, that kind of, I, and I also love that they use the term we the people because it's that claim of the right that we have to make our community what we want it. We don't have to wait for Donald Trump or whoever else to come up with the right policies. We have the right to do that. Yeah, to follow up on that, one of the things this book, I think, probably had it in you, but also taught you along the way and taught I think anybody who reads this book is that you have these three R's, which we can talk about. And the idea that the change, whether you want to call it a revolutionary change, however you want to describe it, evolutionary change, is coming from inside out. It's coming through us, out, it's coming from community, up and out. And, and because of what we are confronting out here, sometimes we feel like we always have to you know, march right up to it and, and just confront it and hit it. But you're taking this and these stories and coming at it from a very different place. Yeah, I think we, and this was one of the discoveries from, from this journey too, I think we get an enormous amount of power when we can claim our place and our relationships in a community. So one of the stories early on is about in Montana, a group of ranchers and a group of native people who worked together to stop what would have been the largest coal mine in, in the state. It would have been 1.2 billion tons of coal. Arch Coal and some other big corporations really wanted this to happen. And in fact, they, they were building a brand new coal terminal at the, at the coast to handle that much coal, because it would have been so much required to ship all that coal off to China. And the Lummi tribe on the coast was opposing it. The Northern Cheyenne tribe mm -hmm. in Montana, as well as the ranchers, were opposing it. And um, so I, I went out there and actually was there when, when they had a ceremony. The Lummi tribe brought a totem pole as a gift to the Northern Cheyenne tribe because they were aware that they were on both ends of this real struggle. And you know, I, when I was there, it was still unclear who was, who was gonna win. You know, the, the ranchers and the native people were using a lot of the same language. They were talking about the fact that they had inherited this beautiful land from previous generations and they had a responsibility to future generations to pass it along, to pass along the water in this land intact. So that kind of connection, that kind of moral authority that they had when they showed up at the state capitol to testify, or, the, or here in D.C. to testify, they brought that moral authority of having that deep commitment to their place and that deep responsibility and long-term relationship to it, and to one another. And they eventually actually did win. That coal, <coughs> coal mine was called off because of what the coal company called regulatory uncertainty, which is code word for the protesters won. And the um, coal terminal as well was called off because the Army Corps of Engineers recognized that the tribes had treaty rights to fisheries there that would be impacted by a coal terminal. So it was one of those success stories. You know, and one of the things we, you touched on just a minute here that I think is really important is that we spend a lot of time in this place divided. Uh, we get divided by race, which we can get into in a little while, and how race kind of, notion, the idea of race and races and why that's critically important to deal with is all through the book, no matter where you are. But we also get divided, like we get this, this false divide around generations. If there's anything like the book, the stories, the stories over and over again were about 
the interaction between elders and youth, listening to each other, not being one on top of the other, but being part of one another, whether it was the apple shop folks in Kentucky or people in Greensboro, North Carolina, or wherever that was that you were talking about. And that's, I think, is really critical because we let ourselves do that. We let ourselves kind of think that, that, that people in their 60s, 70s have nothing to say or interact with people in their 20s and 30s. And, you find, and that, but you're sensing a depth of community that says something different. That's right, and there's so many different things that different generations bring to the table. So there's so much strength there that's possible. And in fact, as part of, you know, one of the themes for me was how much isolation there is in our culture at large. The, the studies show that people now have fewer and fewer people that they can trust in their lives, that they can, that they can rely on and, and tell their secrets to. And other research shows that that kind of isolation is as toxic as cigarette smoking. So it's this, this real poverty of spirit that's completely unnecessary because when we reconnect, we can re we can heal all of those kinds of things. And especially between generations, I think that's true. I think older people yearn to be with younger people and vice versa. One of the people I interviewed was a young rancher who um, who was not currently ranching because his, his family ranch could only support so many people. But when his father retired, he planned to go back. And he was just yearning to go back and be part of that community you know, that he had grown up in and just had that deep love for what his family had always done and what he planned to do as well. I interviewed him because he was, he, his family had one of the ranchers that would have been upended by that coal mine. So, yeah, yeah. It's lots. Individualism works under capitalism. You can buy your way or pay for what you need, but we're dispensable, marginal, because we don't have money. This is Mr. Curtis speaking. So for us, the transformation comes out of collective work. We need resistance, but we also need healing and rebuilding. That's right. Yeah, Wayne Curtis is was somebody I interviewed in Detroit. He and his wife had developed the empty lot next to theirs into a community garden, and they gave away lots of food, and they involved the community. It's one of those communities in Detroit where there's empty lots interspersed with lots with, that are occupied and interspersed with derelict houses, and so people get very afraid, and they tend to withdraw and the garden has been one of the places where people started feeling safe enough to come out and work together. And when I was there, there was a house immediately across the street that was where the woman was being evicted because her mother passed away. She had a reverse mortgage, mm -hmm. and she was unable to get them to renegotiate the terms of the mortgage so that she could stay there. She was, she was about to get evicted. So they, they decided that if they put up a fence where the dumpster was supposed to go, the dumpster wouldn't be able to be placed there and they wouldn't be able to evict her. So they put up a great big fence, and then the neighborhood got together and they painted it with all these beautiful <laughs> sayings and murals and images, and the kids did their little paintings on the bottom, and they had, they had uh, you know, black women matter, and you know, this is our home, and all sorts of things painted all across it. And then they had a phone tree so that if the eviction did in fact take place, they could bring in not just the neighbors, but people from all over the city. Mm -hmm. So it's really an interesting combination of that sense of, well, we're just gonna build a, we're just gonna plant a garden here, you know? And then the things that kind of ripple out from the garden and the community that comes together around that garden. It, I mean, one of the things that, about rippling I think is really important. You, you, as you move through the Midwest especially, you ran into a lot of different kind of co-ops, workers' co-ops co-ops organized in farms by workers who came up from Honduras and, and Central America, food co-ops in Detroit and urban areas in Chicago that were run by the black community, building this giant sense of community. And I think again, you know, when we're faced, what we're faced with out here right now, the idea of going back to community to build up something strong that's stronger than what can come at us is part of what the story's about, right? And these individuals. That's right. I mean, we, we have allowed so much of our society to get taken over by big corporations, and they make decisions elsewhere, and they're not in our interest. So one of the things I was looking for and finding all over the country are people who were reclaiming their economy in various ways, including worker co-ops. And just saying, you know, for example, in Cincinnati, the union movement there was feeling really, I mean, it's true across the country, really feeling embattled, like they keep losing. Companies can just pick up and leave, and people are left, and they can break unions really easily. So the union movement there is collaborating on this and saying, no, we need to start owning our jobs. Our members need to own their jobs. We need to have worker-owned co-ops so that that doesn't happen that way. And now they're collaborating with the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain and the local faith community. The local faith community is on fire about this, and just they're reading the Old Testament about the Jubilee and the 
you know, the forgiving the debt, re releasing the slaves, and returning the land. And, you know, that's resonating with people who are in debt and who the human trafficking and all the mass incarceration and the massive problem of maldistribution of wealth. And, you know, for the Old Testament, that was the returning of the land because that was what wealth was. So the faith community is on fire about this, too. So it's a very interesting constellation of people that are saying, no, our economy has to be rooted here. It has to be accountable to we, the people, in our own city, at our own workplaces. So what do you say to people? And how do you respond to people, maybe it's part of your three R's, that say, look, workers' co-ops, food co-ops, who cares? I mean, they're, t they're small, they're in this community. What do they mean? They mean anything. So my grandfather would say, they're bupkis, they're nothing. But so, <laughs> and that's really an attitude that many people would have, right? Because you're facing what we're facing out here, which is huge, and we see it every day in the news with what's happening down the road. Um, and so, I mean, so, so what about that? What's the argument, what's the discussion that comes out of the people you've been with that says this is where the power lives? This is where it can live, where it should live, what can build something we haven't even, we're not even aware that we can see yet? Well, we could come at that in many different ways. One is that a bunch of people have no access to that other economy, so this is their way of having actual ownership of something and having a job that they can rely on. So. That's one way of coming at it. Another is that the baby boom generation, our generation, is nearing retirement. A lot of people who own businesses are, some of them would like to turn them over to their kids, but some people don't have anybody who wants to take them over. So the co-op movement is talking to a lot of these folks and saying, wouldn't you like to just sell your business to your workers so that they can continue having a job instead of either closing down or selling out to a corporation? So there, that's a potential transfer of, of business interests. <laughs> Another is to look at the economy as part of a larger question of who has power and who has agency. And in Detroit, for example, the, the actual jobs, because jobs are so scarce, jobs is, is only part of how people see their economy. They do a lot of things that are informal, exchanges. And one of, one of the women I interviewed you know, does clothing swaps for kids so that when the kids outgrow the clothes, they get the other kids' clothes. And they have potlucks and they have um, time dollars, so they exchange time and, and with each other because they don't have the money, so they find these other ways to meet each other's needs that don't necessarily involve jobs. I'm not saying that people don't need jobs, they obviously need money and they need to have access to, to the mainstream economy, but people are kind of doing what they can do and it's providing a, um, a sense of possibility that instead of figuring that our whole, our whole society should be increasingly commodified and increasingly under the auspices of big corporations to say, well, maybe it should go the other way. Maybe we should start rekindling the love economy or the informal economy where we just do stuff for each other and we do more stuff for ourselves. We grow more of our own food and we take care of each other. I spent time in, um, in Kentucky mm -hmm. with the apple shop people in Whitesburg, right? Whitesburg? Whitesburg. 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 And so this, you, th you wrote these lines here before the November election. It's about Appalachia, but how it affects the rest of us. You wrote, the despair in this region plays a part in setting the tone for the whole country. Anger grows out of despair. As people le feel left out or pushed aside, and the projection of that anger onto people of color, environmentalists, immigrants, and others whom right-wing shock jocks blame helps fuel support for right-wing politics. And, you know, we talked together before, I mean, I'd spent a lot of time in Appalachia, I interviewed lots of folks in Appalachia. Racism is a deep part of what fuels people with that. You also discovered in Kentucky, which you can talk about. But it's also beyond that and wrapped, and wrapped in other things as well. We kind of want to make things very kind of simplistic in our view of who people are. That's right. You can't really reduce everything down to racism. And you can't reduce everything down to class questions either. There, we have sort of a toxic mix in our country. <laughs> so, absolutely. I mean, we could we could talk a lot about Apple Shop if you want. I don't know how no, hard no, you want to get Apple there. Shop's important because what, what, <laughs> one of the things you, the, 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 you discovered in in, the, in this place that was completely desolate, where the work had left, the mines were shutting down. Uh, they wanted to come in, as you wrote about, to build prisons, yeah. which they do in a lot of poor white communities. They go out and they build prisons because there's no more work. And who's in those prisons? But black folks, brown folks. But the way you describe what Apple Shop did, what they built over the years and how the young people are competing to take that over. And the two young people specifically you kind of focused on in this piece. I think it's a really important story. 
Right, the, cl the coal mines are closing down except for the mountaintop removal, which continues but doesn't require so many people as, as workers. So the destruction is continuing but not the jobs. Black lung disease is taking a big, has had a huge increase. And, and if um, Obamacare is dismantled, a lot of the people who are now getting benefits, the, those benefits are at risk. So it's an area that is really struggling. And um, there's also lots of health issues around obesity and access to fresh food. So, so there's different kinds of things I was seeing. There's, there were people bringing, working to rekindle the tradition of Appalachian people growing their own food and making that easy and, and r r culturally relevant to them and talking about how to cook heart healthy food meals. Um, so that was one thread. And another thread was these young people you were talking about who were saying, okay, that, that coal economy is not our, not our future. And they did not want to encourage the prison industrial complex to increase in, Ap in Kentucky where it's already really strong. When I, was, when I was there, there was this new prison proposed. They were going to spend $450 million to build a prison on the top of one of these blown off mountain tops. The Bureau of Prisons didn't want it because it was way out in the middle of nowhere. And, and there's all sorts of environmental issues about building up there. But the local politician is head of Ways and Means or some damn thing in, in D.C. Right. So he was able to insist that the Bureau of Prisons build a prison there. And so it's going to happen. The local, this young woman I was, I was quoting in there, she says, well, what if, we, what if instead of subsidizing this, this prison, what if instead we, we worked with our local entrepreneurs and gave them a little help to get a leg up so that we could have a homegrown economy? And one of the parts of that is that they're recognizing that they have this extraordinary culture in Appalachia, this beautiful music, this quilting, these, this, this homegrown art that people admire so much, but that they have come to, you know, over the years, have come to think of as poor people's stuff that you didn't want. So Apple Shop has been bringing that back and using that also as part of an of a economic resurgence because now they have uh, night spots where people can come and listen to music and people are attracted to come in from outside. You spend time in that place and you write about this was the place where the first sit-in took place in 1960. It's where the massacre took place when poor people in the communist workers movement marched. It's a place that you write about in terms of restorative justice is taking place and truth and reconciliation. They're attempting about how racism is like so de deep and so pervasive, it's tearing it apart. But this one brilliant elder stands up in a meeting and says, the kids and the cops in the corner don't know where they came from. They don't understand the context of the script they're playing out. That was brilliant, what that woman said. I mean, to think about it in that context. So talk about your time in Greensboro. The massacre happened in 1979. There was five people killed, a number were injured, and it just kind of stayed below the surface for a long time. People who were involved were kind of terrified and traumatized and didn't want to get back involved in organizing the people who were there who survived. Um, they were disparaged as somehow being at fault. The community was really traumatized and, and divided over what happened. So they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The, s the official city refused to be any part of it, but the community just did it anyway and brought in some outside experts to help give it legitimacy and just told the stories, just, just got people to tell the stories of what had happened. And, you know, it's one of those things where there was no big epiphany, no big apologies, but there was this sense of, okay, I think we're a little clearer on what happened. There's a, a narrower range of lies we can tell each other. So they felt like that was some accomplishment there. Then they started another thing called counter stories, and they were they were using the term intentionally to relate to the counter sit-in, but they were doing these conversations between police and members of the community to say, how do we better get along? How do we deal with this proportionate treatment of African Americans by police? Um, again, no huge epiphanies, but uh, that little incremental sense of this is a conversation that's important to be in and we're accountable to each other. And then the last story I tell in there is about the food co-op, the Renaissance food co-op, where a, a number of people from the black community decided that they needed access to good food and they were tired of just waiting for a corporate grocery store to decide to locate near them because that wasn't happening. So they started their own food co-op in an old derelict grocery store. And one of the things that I was really impressed by, it spelt, spoke to an elder, African-American elder, who was part of this, this effort. And he was so on fire about being a member owner. That term owner 
was so important to him. And it really helped as they were working on getting membership for this co-op to use that term owner because a lot of people in that community had never felt that they owned anything. And now they're able to say not, you know, that together, by working on this together, we can not only sit down at the lunch counter, we can own the lunch counter. Their food co-op will have a lunch counter in it. So, <laughs> and folks, you come up, we want to hear it. It's your turn to get up here and ask questions and have a say. And as you're doing that, one of the themes in here had to do a lot, well, two things. A was food. Almost every story has been to do with growing food, people <laughs> sharing food. And the power of that, you know, I think that I mean, literally almost every story <laughs> had some food. And so, in every one of our traditions, we have that food thing happening. And so, I, I think but it's important because it was collective, it was growing it together, it was healthy food in places you didn't think it was going to happen. So, I mean, that was one of the subtexts of this whole book for me, as well as the battle against race and racism everywhere you went that became part of the consciousness building. And you're three R's. So why don't you just wrap about that for a little bit while folks get up here at the mic and say what they got to say. Um, yeah, the three R's are, uh, those are embedded in the book, but they really got clear to me after the Trump election. So I happened to be at Standing Rock, report. I finished the book. I was at Standing Rock reporting for Yes Magazine about what was happening there when the election results came in. Mm -hmm. And I remember crawling out of my icy tent to find out what had happened, that, that things had gone the way they had. And then I called my colleagues back at Yes Magazine and said, you know, I, ha I turned in a column, but I have something different I need to write. And it was basically to say, you know, this is like a disaster, and when a disaster strikes, we need to reach out to each other. We need to find out who's most vulnerable, who's most likely to get hurt, and make sure that they know we're there. And certainly that means starting with Muslims, and it means starting with immigrants, but really it includes people of color, it could be school teachers who have the gall to teach about evolution. It could be a journalist. It could be a Jewish community. There's so many different people who could be targeted at any time. And we know that authoritarian governments thrive when they isolate us from one another. So we have to not let that happen. We have to reach out to one another and tell each other, I've got your back. Do you have my back? I've got your back. We're doing that in our community right now. And it's something that's really important in this age of social media. It's really important that we not kid ourselves and think that being on Facebook with a bunch of people is the same thing, because it's not. Right. We have to show up for each other in person, and that's where we really can create that sense of community and that sense of safety and also break out of that toxic isolation, which is a, an issue regardless. So that sense of reconnecting, so that's one of, the, one of the R's, reconnecting. And that's a foundation for real power. Because then when we get to the second R, which is resistance, we know who we're working with. We're working with our neighbors. We're working with these people we've built trust with. We know we're not going to be out there all by ourselves getting picked off. So that means whether it's you know doing what uh, Move On and other folks are doing right now, going every Tuesday to the member of Congress and saying, we insist that you speak up for us. You know, you, we're, not, we're not okay with you rolling over on these. So it's, it could be that kind of thing. It could be you know, sitting down in front of Wells Fargo because of their involvement in the, in the Standing Rock and the DAPL pipeline. It could be um, local boycotts if companies are uh, misbehaving. It could be also the third R, which is revitalization because it's really important that we not give up on our dreams and our beautiful solutions because of what's happening at the national level. We can still move those forward. And that's a lot of where we get the energy and the inspiration to keep going. Because I think one of the things that a lot of people are afraid of is protest fatigue or community involvement fatigue. It's like, oh, I don't know, I'm just done with the community stuff. But sometimes it happens the other way. And, and that was something I was really struck by on my journey, is how many times people would get together and they were so happy to be together. There is this joy, there's just this excitement. So regardless of the politics, which we know we need to be doing, there is just this sense of, of the um, soul nourishing quality of being together with a bunch of people and making stuff happen. So then instead of fatigue, it's the other thing, right? In instead of feeling like you don't want to be involved anymore, you do. So that, those are all sources of power. Our power is in that kind of connection and that kind of involvement. And, and that's where I think we, we can stave off some of the worst of what may be planned for us yeah. <laughs> in the current administration. I mean, I, I, how many of you all here were 
um, this last week either at BWI or Dulles. Or DFW. Uh, or where? DFW, Dallas. Oh, D oh, you're Dallas. What? I wasn't thinking about Dallas. This is so far away. But there you go. I mean, I was at BWI. Supreme Court. Supreme Court? Fine. Good. So when I was at BWI, one of the things, it, it, it made me think of your book. There were 2,000 people jammed into Baltimore, Washington uh, International Airport. And they were black and white and Muslim and Jewish and Christian and young and old and gay, straight and lesbian, queer, everybody in this place together. One of the things I saw, when I saw, saw yarmulkes on people's heads, standing right next to women with hijabs on, holding signs together, that was very powerful. You know, so there's something about a spontaneity happening now that it, it has a joy in it. You know, it wasn't all like tears and crying. There was, people were like chanting with joy and belief of something more beautiful than what's being thrust upon us. And that's part of what the book is about too, is that people are moving with this joy. And I think that's something we forget sometimes. And I, I, talk, I mean, I, I'd like to hear we all think about that as well and, and kind of lead it off, sir. I mean, I think that, you know, you, we think that just because we believe in a certain way and we don't like what we see going out there, that it all has to be negative and depressing and attacking. But if it, you know, it's like with King, it came from a place of love and if, with Malcolm, it came from a place of love. Well, I feel it came, and, and it, and it you, you have to, that says something different and moves things in a different way, which is why I think what we're seeing now could have a life of its own, like I have not seen since I was down south in the civil rights movement or in doing the organizing I did in the 60s. There's something, there's an energy happening now that I've really never seen, just like there's an evilness I've never seen, I think, <laughs> in most of my yeah. life. Agreed. And Anne was going to ask a question. So Anne, go, Anne, go ahead, please. <laughs> well, I'd just like to tell you that right now at DCA, there are 2,000 people yeah. right Ooh, down here at our little airport. Yeah. Even without an international terminal, they're down there right now. Um, since you mentioned Standing Rock, there are several of us that have been at Standing Rock. And just to let you know, for one more opportunity for you all to get right out there on the streets tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we're going to have a demo because right now it looks like the police are going into Standing Rock and breaking up part of the camp. So we need all of That's happening now? Right now. Right now. So we need all your help to go down there to challenge the Corps of Engineers. As you mentioned, you know, other, other places the Corps has backed off and they backed off at the very end of the Obama administration, but now they have their marching orders and some of them are not going to be like Sally Yates did to stand up to them. And, and so we need your help to come down there. And it's right down by Judiciary Square. It's also important to comment at the Army Corps of Engineers site on the environmental impact statement. Yes. Because that's one more way that, for, that they can just hear from many, many, many people that, they, that people do want a, a vigorous environmental impact statement on that pipeline, not to just rubber stamp it because Trump has an investment in it or for whatever other reason. A small local observation. Um, Apple Shop was, I think, like the 40-year-old storytelling mm -hmm. collective, theater, right. Whitesburg, Kentucky. Yep. And in D.C., we have two new low-power FM stations. We are Community Radio, um, What's Tacoma call Radio, W-O-W-D, oh, and cool. we have in Arlington, W-E-R-A. And so it's a, it, these are both new stations within the last year. Of, uh, it's a way to connect locally. Like Apple Shop has made a statement in its region. And I think we have, uh, with the new low power, uh, an opportunity to create the same kind of um, powerful, very local voice. So just uh, thank you for paying attention to Apple Shop and then watch all of us low powers come along. You can count us in because the Center for Emerging Media got the lower power signal from, for Baltimore. So we worked on that up there as well. Great, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, just to follow up <coughs> on her uh, remarks about WOWD, uh, we in Tacoma Park, Maryland, are having a big teach-in on Sanctuary City this Saturday at 3 p.m. I would hope some of you would come and uh, get some uh, inspiration to do it in your own towns. Tacoma Park, which is right on the border of D.C. here, uh, has been a sanctuary city since 19, I think 1983. The day after the election, uh, almost spontaneously, 800 people showed up with no real uh, announcements, just word of mouth, uh, to hear our mayor speak on the necessity for maintaining our diversity and uh, our uh, 
uh, Sanctuary City and just generally uh, keeping spirits up. So I think Tacoma Park might be a good idea to make a uh, little, you know, report on the other Tacoma. <laughs> we've been a set, we've been in nuclear free zone since 1983. No one uh, the city cannot buy anything from any company that makes nuclear weapons, delivery systems, components. They can't buy a pencil, they can't buy a police car. We just ignore any of these companies. And here in the area people know it, know it as the People's Republic of Tacoma Park. <laughs> My question is, um, it's first a comment with the question. So I was listening to your stories and I thought, oh, there are many conservative Republicans who would find these stories to be really helpful because they're sort of a pull yourself up from your bootstraps kind of story. Like our community's been abandoned, we're gonna take care of ourselves and these stories could be examples of, look, they want to do their own thing. They want to own their own businesses. They want to be dis determining their own destiny. And so my question is, what's the role of government for these communities? Are they post-government? Do they have a post-government help kind of view? And are, is this sort of, are we in a post-government welfare place, which I find very disturbing, especially in the education front? What is the view of government in these communities? That's sort of missing and I don't know if it's that because there hope there's a hopelessness and they're just we're moving on or is there any kind of political views towards their local government or their city councils or or that sort of thing yeah great question so I think some people are fed up with government so they're just trying to get stuff done regardless I think there's some people who in in some ar arenas the government puts its thumb on the side of the scale of big corporations at the expense of local economy. So for example, the whole econom economic development field is all about bringing in a big corporate employer. Well, who's paying the taxes, the local taxes, to give those subsidies to that big corporate? A lot of local businesses are. So government is putting their thumb on the wrong side of the scale. So in some cases, it's not being anti-government, it's just government needs to get it right. In Detroit, people were really upset because government was all about really investing in the downtown, which was, again, a bunch of corporate employers bringing in new residents who are pre predominantly white and still ignoring all the African-American communities all around the edge. So it wasn't that they were anti-government, it was just that government had ignored them for so long and they'd been trying to get the attention of government and, and not had success. But, I, you know, the, the, the Newark story is really about a government in which the mayor can't, comes out of the community, you know, comes out of 20 years or so of community uh, organizing. And now he's trying to bring that kind of an idea into city government. Mm -hmm. So that was one story where it was kind of saying, no, the government can actually work for we the people. My sort of overall take is that government tends to be the laggard rather than the leader. So we have to be out in front, and then we need to be politically powerful enough to bring government with us. <laughs> but a lot of the, the real innovation, I think, is, is not led by government. It's, it's led by more spunky community groups. <coughs> so it's kind of a complicated answer. <laughs> this is a complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> because government, to me, like government, government is our, is, would be the infrastructure, like a single payer system would be the infrastructure to let healthcare bloom in local places, you know that looking at it like that, as opposed to when I debate conservatives or liberals, it's not like you talk about the system. It's that you know it doesn't mean government control of healthcare. It means a system that pays for our healthcare, allows doctors and healers and nurses and others, other practitioners, to flower in the communities, just like the railroads were built and allowed communities to flower after they stole the land from the native people, but allowed communities to flourish along the way. That was the structure, the infrastructure. That's what we're supposed to do.